Kiora is a phrase in Maori language which means be well. New Zealand is one of the most remote corners of the world. It consists of two volcanic islands. The nearest landmass is Australia, a four-hour flight from Auckland. On my way there, I had a quick stopover in Tahiti. My adventure began in Auckland, the largest city of New Zealand. From there, I went to Wellington, then on a one-day trip to Picton in the South Island, and I've even managed to stop at a town of Matamata, where the film's Hobbit were created. Maori is an ethnic group which lived in New Zealand long before the arrival of white settlers. They have their own language and culture, maintained until today despite English domination. The influence of Maori language is ever-present here and I'll try to show it in this film. This beautiful sunrise greeted me on May 14th at the hotel. The city and port were waking up on a busy Monday morning and in the distance I've noticed the top of a Rangitoto mountain. We'll go there later. Auckland has an interesting architecture in the city center. The sky tower dominates the skyline. This time-lapse shot was taken on the opposite side of the bay. The Auckland Bridge loomed over my head on the right side. Sky Tower is over a thousand feet or 300 meters high and there is an observation platform for tourists at the top. That day was a bit cloudy. I should have waited for the weather to clear up. Auckland is a modern city, although you need to have good legs if you want to walk on foot. The up and down hills of the town can literally take your breath away. A network of ferries is a part of a transit system in Auckland. Ships travel from one side of the bay to the other and public transit tickets are valid on these routes.
I've captured a beautiful sunset on my way to a place called Moon Bay. New Zealand has an incredible connection with the ocean. The Maritime Museum features the innovators and dreamers who forged New Zealand's spirit of exploration. The inside of the museum is filled with boats, old and new. Here you can check your knowledge of the marine knots. This catamaran was made entirely of natural materials. No plastics or fiberglass were used. It was first proposed in 1980 by a group of like-minded individuals, many of whom were Auckland Union Steamship Company members. It's a home to a growing collection of maritime archives within the Auckland Maritime Society. I've had the pleasure of sailing aboard one of the museum's heritage vessels, a skull called Ted Ashby. It was an awesome one-hour trip around the Auckland Harbour. And that's a curiosity. Pay attention to car traffic. First, they go in one direction, then in the other, and all the pedestrians wait for their turn. Then the car traffic stops, and for 30 seconds, Pedestrians can go anywhere they want. Yeah. 
The music you hear in the background is an artist playing in front of a Starbucks cafe. A Maori word for high mountain is an interesting place in the center of Auckland. It's a park called One Tree Hill. Instead of workers, sheep were employed here and they patiently maintained the grass. I was interested in this awkward tree. It's a pine that has been cut at the top and it began to grow sideways in all directions. The next adventure was Mata Mata. It's another Maori word which means watch this. The land here belongs to the Alexander family. It is so far away from civilization that you will not find any high voltage lines here and planes rarely fly overhead. The filmmakers who worked on The Hobbit found their middle earth here. This is Hobbiton. The Hobbit houses are real and you can actually enter some of them. Most of these artifacts are just film props, like this plastic bread and pastries. This house is well known to those who watch the movies. Bilbo Baggins lived here. Only movie crews have access to the inside of it because the interior is fully equipped and it's used in the films. In the distance you can see the great oak where hobbits celebrate their special occasions. We were greeted with a feast at the Green Dragon Inn. The food was real and there was only a handful of movie props at the table.
in the evening, after the feast, we were given these lanterns and went under the great oak to say goodbye to the Hobbiton. Rangitoto is the word for lava in Maori. It is a volcanic island deep in the Bay of Auckland. 800 years ago, a small volcano erupted here and left this place behind. The island is not inhabited with the exception of a few houses for scientists and park rangers. To get there, I had to take a ferry at 7 a.m. The morning light painted the city skyline in golden hue. This is a view of the volcano from the moon bay. And that's a perspective from Davenport. A Rangitoto Pier has greeted me with Maori sculptures. The island can be visited in several ways. You can go straight to the top and then come back to the marina. I've decided to take a longer walk around the island. I wanted to see the Mackenzie Bay beach. Then I walked to the summit and returned to the marina. It took me about eight hours. Black's Point is a place where you can see the settlement of black gulls. The Mackenzie Bay is a volcanic beach. Nature has not yet crushed all of its volcanic rocks. Vegetation at Rangitoto is a mix of tropical and marine flora. Some of these plants are really strange, out of this world creations. A set of comfortable stairs was built near the summit for tired explorers.
and that's a crater. It is covered with dense vegetation today, but 800 years ago it was a bubbling lava pit. Finally, I have reached the summit. Another million dollar view. You can see the city of Davenport in the foreground and in the back, the skyline of Auckland. Auckland Zoo is laid on 40 acres next to Western Springs Park, not far from downtown Auckland. It opened in 1922 and slowly expanded to a beautiful park we see here today. Of course, the main reason I'm here is the symbol of New Zealand, the kiwi bird. Kiwi are creatures of the night. You can see them in the wild in New Zealand, but it takes a lot of time and patience to find them in their natural habitat. Let's see if we, if we can take a closer look at them here. This is a red panda, a small bear that lives high in the trees. This parrot has learned a few words from the visitors. And that's a serval cat. Adults reach up to 40 pounds or 20 kilograms. In the end, I found a place where kiwi birds live. It's an artificial environment, the night world built for the shy bird. Kiwi were behind the glass and I had to wait patiently to see them. In the end, one of them decided to have a meal, worms and insects plucked from the forest floor. My kiwi was in constant motion, so I could not fully really capture it, but in the end, I got it. Manukau means wading birds in the Maori language. It is also the name of the straits closing the sea access to Auckland from the west. There is a lighthouse on the south side. At the entrance to the strait there is a sand dune. The English ship HMS Orpheus sank here in 1863. Almost 190 people died in this catastrophe.
nearly a two hour trip around town brought me to the second side of Manukau. was a long ride and the road got really narrow as the asphalt surface disappeared. A high cliff on the right side was scary but that wasn't the end of this adventure. A tree fell on the road and a road crew had to chop it down. I had to wait here for 30 minutes. Ah, finally a normal parking lot. I got there in this red car. The Manukau head on the north side is not a typical white sandy beach, it's made of black volcanic dust that sparkles in the sun. I have recorded a few minutes of a commentary here, but the wind howled in the microphones and not much of it was useful. You can see it in the bloopers at the end of this film. The lighthouse is on the other side, behind these rocks, and from the top of this mountain you can see a panorama of the Manukau Strait. A few miles north of Manakau Heads, you can find Piha Beach. It's a gorgeous coastal settlement, a paradise for surfers, swimmers and fishermen. This area has retained a lot of its natural beauty due to isolation. It's located some 30 miles south of Auckland and to get here you must have a car and you have to take a long winding road. Not your typical beach trip for masses. The beach is divided in half by Lion Rock 
when the tide is high, you will need to negotiate some seawater to get to the northern part. Otherwise, the Lion Rock is climbable. A quick climb to the top of the Tasman Lookout, and here it is, the Piha Beach in all its glory. On May 20th, I took a short flight to Wellington. It's the capital of New Zealand, and just like Auckland, it's a city surrounded by the sea. First stop in Wellington, Mount Victoria. It is the highest point in the city. These areas were once a place for grazing sheep and cattle. It's a public park today. This brown building in the middle of the hill is a Catholic church dedicated to Saint Gerard. We'll go there later. The whole city is visible from the top of the mountain. In the east, you can see the Wellington Airport. And the view from the other side is breathtaking especially at sunset. Courtney Place is an important transit point of the city. Many bus lines have their terminals here. It is also a place where you can easily find a movie theater and other entertainment. The hungry travelers can stop here for a Japanese snack or more traditional pizza and coffee. And this is the same place during the day. This is the Saint Gerard Catholic Church I mentioned earlier. A Freiburg beach below is a rich neighborhood of Wellington. I found a shortcut here, a squiggly path accessible only to pedestrians. Let's go.
Wellington is the capital of New Zealand. This building is called the Beehive. This is the central government of this country. The building was placed on a soft suspension system resistant to earthquakes. I went inside, but unfortunately I was not allowed to take pictures or videos, so you'll have to take my word for it. It was amazing. Here we have a government library. And this is the Supreme Court of New Zealand. The Wellington City Centre is a mix of old and new architecture. I was here in the morning and I noticed cool light reflections on the buildings. They are produced by these modern glass giants. Take a look. St. Paul's Church is one of the oldest temples in Wellington. This Anglican church was once located near the port. The winds here are so strong, people were afraid that the church would land in the water. That's why it was moved to the city center. This church is almost 100% wooden and its architecture is neo-Gothic. From the outside it looks like an average white building, but the interior is reminiscent of a wooden boat flipped upside down. The all wood design can certainly give that impression. I found an interesting historic tram line in Wellington. It's a special type of tram propelled by a steel cable hidden between the rails. It's similar to a system used by the San Francisco cable car. The seats were installed on an angle to compensate for the steep incline. In the old days, there were even seats outside of a car, and passengers had to hold on to these leather belts. In 2002, this line has celebrated the 100th anniversary of existence. Today's cars are much lighter, 
let's go to the top. Can you see this cable between the rails? It drives the tram line. Two cars operate on this line and in the tunnels a display of lights gives the travelers a colorful entertainment. The whole journey takes about 5 minutes. A beautiful panoramic view of Wellington awaits you at the top and you can even visit the museum. I took a train from Wellington and an hour later I found myself in the town of Pekakariki. This word means barren land in Maori. There is a modest railway museum here. At the beginning of the 20th century, Pekakariki was the last suburban settlement in Wellington. It was also an important stop for cargo trains. The curator of the museum, David Johnson, allowed me to go up and watch these antique devices. This is one of a few potbelly stoves preserved at this location. Not far from the railway museum, I found a collection of old street trams. These cars once rode the streets of Wellington, and when they were decommissioned, a handful of them was brought to this museum. Thank you. 
There is even one working line here and you can take a tram to the beach for a small fee. Pekakariki has a beautiful beach. In the distance, you can even see the peaks of the remote South Island. This is the Frank Kids Park near Wellington Port. It features a shopping center, a bike path and attractions for children and adults. This free piano is for anyone who can play. I didn't have to wait long for a volunteer. And this is a town of Petone, that's how the local residents pronounce it, on the other side of the bay. I was here in May, at the end of New Zealand summer, so I did not see any beachgoers. I suppose it's nice here on the hot December days. Here I'm trying to attach my GoPro camera to a waterproof tripod. And the final result. The pier in Petone was once a stop for the ferries from the city. It was decommissioned when an earthquake damaged it a few years ago. The wind blew mercilessly. I wanted to do some commentary here, but nothing came out of it. From Petone, I took a bus to a day's bay. This pier has a ferry connection to the city, but before I went there, I've managed to capture some interesting sunset shots.
in the park, Dory Leslie, I found a familiar character. This is a gift from the president of Chile, who visited New Zealand in 2004. This Moai is of course a copy, but uh, oh no, what's happening here again? This guy is chasing me all over the world. It was time to go on. An Uber car drove me to the end of the paved road and then I had to go on foot. four kilometers or three miles of sand and gravel each way to the area called Red Rocks. I've even managed to see a courageous surfer. This guy must know these waters really well. Here we have the red rocks and finally a gap in the mountain called the Devil's Gate. All this walking would not be worth the effort if not for a colony of seals nearby. Perfectly camouflaged, they bask in here in the sun, one large male and about 10 females. I walked a bit too close and the male gave me a stern look. When that didn't work, he showed me his teeth. Okay buddy, I'll step back. You don't have to worry. Your ladies are too hairy for my taste. In New Zealand I visited the southern island but only for one day. It was however a fascinating trip that gave me this special moment I always look for in my journeys. A Blue Bridge Ferry took me to the South Island. I've had a small cabin with a comfortable sleeping berth. The ferry docked in Picton at 5 a.m.
Picton is a small port, but it's a beginning of many routes for the travelers and cargo. I've rented a car and the adventure began. The first stop was the Peloros Bridge and River. Then I drove south and I stopped in the vineyards into Marina. Of course, I was once again driving on the left side of the road. This is the Kulen viewpoint. Look at this gorgeous sunrise. It was 8 a.m. The Pelorus River is one of a few sources of fresh water in this area. It is crystal clear because it flows from the snow-capped mountain peaks and there is no heavy industry here. The Pelorus Bridge is a one-lane passage. I've had a tasty lunch at Jack's Cafe nearby. For a moment, I felt like I drove into Windows XP. Do you remember that photo? This area is the heartland of New Zealand vineyards. No wonder the wine from this place is so good. May is the end of summer in the southern hemisphere. The grapes were already harvested, but the plants were still covered in leaves.
and suddenly I saw something beautiful like a fairy tale, sheep grazing among the grape plants. I had to stop and see it up close. And this was my special moment. Here I felt that I was really in New Zealand. Kia ora. Be well. The wind howled in the microphones on Manukau. This was recorded with a windscreen. Are the opening to a passage leading to Auckland. Sometimes you can spot the planes on approach to the airport. And that without. And that's a classic members. line stumble. It ha it's, a, it's a home to a growing collection of maritime archives with the Auckland Maritime Society. Here I've had my camera in the water, but I've mistakenly set it up in a time-lapse mode instead of normal video. Here is the whole incident in slow motion. A huge wave came and it washed my camera rig away along with my shoes. I had to salvage my stuff and in the process I got soaked. In Wellington, at the top of Mount Victoria, wind was so bad it was tipping people over. It also got my tripod and my attempt of a time lapse of a sunset. It was unbearable. I had to repeat it next day. Here I've had a tripod, but I've decided to hand film it. Of course, the shot came out shaky and I had to use a still photo in the film. Here is a crowd of people constantly walking in my shot. And here is one more shaky hand video. I have to learn to use a tripod more. Here I couldn't decide how to show this moai. And here, the tripod and the camera straps wanted to have a role in the video too. In 
the vineyards, I have attached a camera to the roof of the car. Only when I sat down behind the wheel, I realized the camera was crooked. I've tried to correct it while driving, but I've only made it worse. There, that's better. The camera slumped down on a shaky road and all that was filmed was a shadow of the car. That's how the time-lapse videos are made. You attach a camera to a tripod on widespread legs and you wait 30 minutes to an hour. This is my equipment bag. Some electronics were triple wrapped to protect them from the rain and sand. A fisheye lens needed some patience too. I'll see you in the next film.